Hey guys, Corbin here, and I'm going to talk about creating inset doors and how to get the gap to be consistent all the way around so it looks just perfect. And the hard thing about inset doors is if the gap is just slightly off, your eye will see it and it will bother you. So I'm trying to figure out how to do it in the best way I can, and I'm going to just show you what I'm going to do and what I've been doing to create a nice perfect fit. So this door here is already done has a nice fit. First of all, what size gap do I want? I want a 3 32nd inch gap all the way around the door. And so the first thing I did was to rip a bunch of little, little gauges, little shims at 3 32nd of an inch. And that way I can use them to see how well stuff is going as I'm fitting things. In addition, I also ripped a 3 16 inch gap uh, feeler. And the reason I did this is 3 16 of an inch is exactly twice 3 30 seconds. So if I were to shove the drawer face up to the corner, I could create a 3 16 inch gap on the bottom right, and that would give me 3 30 seconds all the way around. So that's an alternative way that I could actually square up the doors in the center. But I kind of use a combination of both techniques to get it just right. So I will show you what I'm going to do when I trim up one of the door faces. And let's talk about, first of all, how I constructed the doors to account for this. So I wanted the doors to have a 3 32nd inch gap, and I wanted to be able to remove some material to get that, because it may not be perfectly square. So when I created the door and drawer faces, these, the, these guys here, the styles, and the rails, I ripped at 1 16th of an inch larger than what it really needs to be. And so that's gonna encroach on my gap on all the sides, and that means I can have some extra space to remove. So I made it just a little bit bigger. So I designed it in SketchUp, did the model exactly the size I wanted, and then when I ripped these guys, I just made them slightly bigger. Of course, the length has to be 1 16th of an inch larger, uh, or actually, times two, which is, um, you know, two sixteenths or an eighth. So, uh, because you're gonna have to make the, them a little bit taller to account for the increased thickness. So I went ahead and did that. Uh, I didn't even account for it, I just wrote it down on a piece of paper when I created the doors. So that way I had a little bit of material to remove. First thing I had to do, I usually sand the face frame last after I put it on everything assembled. I sand the insides before I assemble because that way you can get to the corners. But the face frame, this portion here, this plane, I did last after it was all assembled. So I did that first because that way I can get it nice and in line with everything. And so that, that was one of the first steps I did. And let's go take a look at one of the door faces and see how we're going to go ahead and process that. All right, where to begin? I start with my model in SketchUp. Hit up the description to download my kitchen model and play around with it yourself. As I noted before, the inset gap is 3 seconds of an inch, which is pretty standard. When generating my cut list, I want to rip the pieces 1 16th of an inch wider to give me some space to later clean up. The styles of the doors also need to be 1 16th of an inch longer to accommodate for this additional width. I don't rip the door bottom piece larger or do any cleanup on it because it doesn't touch anything on the bottom. However, the drawers are surrounded on all four sides and need to be 1 8 inch taller to accommodate for the increased width of the rails. As usual, I generate a cut list by hand and manually add in the additional width for each piece. It is time consuming to manually add fractions, so I just use a simple app for my iPhone called Fraction Plus to do the addition. After I make up the cut list, I plane the boards to 3 quarters of an inch thick, then rough cut the wood to length, rip them to the final width, and finally cross cut them to the final size. I check off pieces on my cut list as I make them, and finally I get a stockpile of everything I need. I also cut the plywood out for the doors. I'm using A grade half inch alder ply. The plywood is cut to be half inch larger than shown on the model in order for it to sit in a quarter inch groove. The first thing I do is cut out the accent in the bottom of the doors. I detailed this process in episode 4, so check out the link and I'll put in the description too so you can see. 
and here's a quick description of what I do. I mark out what I need to do on the piece of wood. I drop my rip blade into the table saw and sink the height below the table. I turn on the saw, raise the blade until it just breaks the surface, and then push the piece until the ending location. I then stop the saw, wait until it completely stops spinning, and then I remove the piece. I then go over to the band saw and finish cutting out the little triangle corners, and then I am left with a bunch of pieces that now have a rough bottom. So I take these over and drop them to a clamp and just sand it flush. I just use 150 and then I hit it with 220 and it doesn't take too long. I then start to lay out individual doors and drawer faces. I think grain orientation is important so I take time to kind of orient the pieces the way I want. And then I go ahead and mark where the pieces will line up so I can do my cuts for the grooves. The grooves will extend a quarter inch deeper than the location of the board so I just uh, use a little marker to add a quarter inch down and once I do one I just transfer the marks to all the other pieces and that way I don't have to do a lot of measuring. I mark the stop groove location on both sides of the piece of the wood and this is going to be where I'm going to want to cut to. I've discussed this in some other videos but what I'm going to do is line up uh, some lines on the table saw that indicate the starting and ending location of the uh, saw blade for a dado cut. I'm going to turn the blade on and just drop it down onto the saw blade really slowly and carefully and use some push sticks to push it until my lines line up with the stop line right here which I'm pointing out and then I stop the table saw with my hip, wait until the blade completely stops and then I can remove the piece. I then flip the piece over and repeat it again and that way my groove is exactly on center. And I just did some test cuts so that the plywood will fit nicely in this groove. I try to avoid getting my fingers really close to the saw blade so I can use the jig that I discussed in a previous episode to hold small pieces down and this will allow me to keep my fingers pretty far away when I cut the groove. I just move the fence over three quarters of an inch to accommodate for the jig's thickness and basically repeat the same steps. So I flip on the table saw and again you have to be really careful doing this. If that hit the saw when it was starting to spin up it could kick it back at you and you have to be really gentle and slow when you push the piece down otherwise it could kick back at you. In fact I make a mistake here in a second that you'll see. I turn the saw off and I don't wait for it to completely stop spinning down and I started to move the piece a little bit and it kicked back. So word of caution here, be careful. The stop grooves need some cleanup to the finishing line because it leaves a semicircle. So I go ahead and just clamp it down and clean up that waste area with some chisels. So this leaves me with a bunch of pieces and I need to start cutting the joints. As usual, I'm going to just use double biscuit joints. So I have to mark out my location first. I try and put it roughly in the center of the thicker bottom piece. And again, I just mark it on one piece and then I will transfer these marks to all my other pieces. And that way I don't have to measure a bunch. I use FF biscuits for my Porter Cable biscuit joiner and so I have to change the blade to a special FF biscuit joiner blade. So I take the old one out, swap in the new one and set it up. I toss a scrap piece in a clamp and I do a test cut so I can have a relatively uniform slot in the piece. For rapid cutting of the biscuit joints, I'll just clamp a backer piece to my table and that way I can flip it over and do the double biscuit joints really quickly for individual pieces. I always do a test for the biscuits because sometimes due to varying thicknesses or I don't know my hand position or whatever, they won't fit quite right and need to be cut again. I then do a test for the plywood to make sure it fits in the grooves. I can sometimes sand the edges of the plywood a bit so it fits in a little bit better 
And this usually just involves kind of tweaking the groove, sanding it a little bit, doing some fits until it all goes together and can move just a little bit inside of it without leaving a gap anywhere. Then the next step is for me to sand the interior pieces at this time because it's going to be really difficult to sand it after it's all glued up. So I sand the interior with 150 and then 220. I also sand the plywood, usually just with 220, but sometimes I hit it with 150 to remove scratches. Usually at some point, once I have the pieces together, I mark them with little arrows to indicate which side's up. And that way I won't mess up with the glue up and I know which side I want to be facing out, usually the, the best side of the wood and the plywood. I'm then ready for glue up. And I usually work my way from the left side to the right side. I put all the pieces up on the edge, stick some glue in the biscuit joints and on the bottom joint. I glue in the plywood sheets just really lightly with a strip of glue. I don't spread out that center glue in the strip because I don't really feel it's necessary to really glue in the plywood and this is just kind of an extra step just to add some strength. The plywood is dimensionally stable and it will not move or have any problems even in wet environments like a bathroom. I spread out the glue with my fingers and toss in a couple of the biscuits and start assembly from one side to the other. So once I have it all together, I start clamping it. I use some parallel clamps and really only need two clamps for this type of uh, drawer or door. And I'll show some other setups I'm gonna do for some of my other ones. And as I go along, I use the framing square to keep everything aligned. And now I'm gonna have to make sure it's really aligned because anything that's out of square will cause some trouble. I tighten the clamps down, kind of pound things to get it to be straight, and then just set it down to dry. Some additional notes on the doors that have a centerpiece. I don't cut a biscuit on those. They kind of, they are glued in, but they basically just float. And here's the set for a more complex door, one of my top doors. I have to clamp it on the three different locations in the, in the, I don't know, the width, and also one in the height to kind of hold it all together nice and tightly. Once the glue dries in the doors, the next step is to make these spacers, three thirty seconds of an inch. My door design has no bottom frame to do the alignment to, and uh, so it doesn't need any trimming, so I just have to trim the top and the two sides, but I need some way to hold it up with the right location. So I just go ahead and grab a couple clamps and clamp on a piece of plywood and that way I can set it on top of that. So I'll hold the door up and use the spacers as a guide to kind of figure out how much I need to trim off. And really I want to just get the sides to be parallel to the, uh, the face frame first and then I can make it thinner if I need to be to have the same gap around the entire edge of it. And so I kind of just use the spacers as a guide and we'll either use them or a framing square to draw a nice, nice tight line of what I need to trim off on the wood. So what I'm going to do is use some blue tape to build up a little bit thicker of a side to cut a taper on the opposite side. This will push it out on the opposite side by about as much as the tape you put on it. And so I'll take it add some tape and then run it through the table saw where it's really close to the blade and kind of see how much it's going to take off on this particular taper and if it is about as much as I need to have it take off according to what I drew as a little line. And if it is, and if it looks pretty close, then I'll go ahead and flip the saw on and run it through. You'll notice as I do the cut, I'm not using a guard. I do use a splitter for a little bit of safety, but I'm taking very little bit off at a time and I want to watch it as I'm doing the cut to make sure it's cutting right by the line. And if it's not, I'll stop it and adjust things. After I do a cut, I remove the tape and the shims. I'll sometimes mark it with a pencil because I'm gonna probably be taping it back on to cut a little bit more and I need to know where I'd put it. So I take the door back over to the cabinet and see how well it fits up. I'll usually 
shove it against the side that I'm trimming up and see if the lines are pretty tight. And here I can just visually tell that it needs more on the, the top left side than the bottom. It's always easier to undercut than to overcut. And so to cut a little bit more, I'll either add more tape to make it a little bit thicker, or I'll move the tape a little bit further down on the door so that uh, it will just be pushing out a little bit more of a different area. And again, I run it through without it on so I can see how much it's gonna take off. And then I go ahead and cut it. So I repeat the process and use my 3 32nd of an inch shims to kind of figure out how the gap's going. And wherever it's a little bit too tight, I'll remove a little bit more. I'm gonna show a few more techniques on what I'll do to go ahead and do this. If I don't need a full length taper, I will just use my jack plane to shave off a little bit and then go ahead and sand it down and see how the fit works. I trimmed the top on the table saw too, mainly because it's also ripping, but notice the accent in the bottom will cause the piece to push out and so I have to stop the saw before this happens to avoid nicking the end. Eventually I'll have it so the doors will prop up with just the shims and I can visually see if the gap looks nice and even on all sides. And basically I'll just continue trimming it until it looks good to me and it looks pretty even. All right, so I just repeated the process of ripping tiny bits amount off each time, just tapping that rip fence really lightly until I can get a very consistent 3 32nd inch gap all the way around with my feelers. I sometimes like to do it a little bit on the tight side, and that way I can just sand a little bit down anyways on my final sanding. And just a little tape and a little bit of inspection, and it looks good. That's All right, in the next episode, I'll be making some drawers and finishing up anything on the doors.